Warren Series Seminar. Um, I have the honor of moder moderating and introducing uh, today's speaker, who is Professor Otto Strock from the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Geoengineering. Most of you know Otto very well, but I'd like to provide a brief introduction. Uh, Professor Strock received his degrees from Delft University um, in civil engineering in the early 70s and soon after joined the faculty of the University of Minnesota in the Department of Civil and Mineral Engineering. Um, so Otto has been here for uh, 40 years. Um, he has received many honors and awards over the years. I'll just mention one, and that is he is a foreign member of the Royal Academy of Sciences of the Netherlands. Of course, Otto has uh, worked in many areas, um, mentioning just a few, uh, granular mechanics, uh, discrete element modeling of granular systems, and of course uh, seminal work that you'll be hearing about today in the area of groundwater mechanics where he and his colleagues have developed the analytic element technique. So with that, uh, please help me welcome Professor Strzok. Thank you, Joe. Um, it might surprise you, but this talk is actually inspired by a talk by Ted Galambos. <laughs> a long time ago, he gave a talk that really shook me about the state of the infrastructure in the United States. And I remember it was a very convincing talk, and it really disturbed me that things would go that bad. And of course, as you all know, it, they've gotten from bad to worse. Uh, it's a similar situation in the area of groundwater. It's, it's a we are facing very serious problems, and uh, I think it's important that faculty will point these things out. So what I'm going to do is uh, give a talk in two parts. The first part is just really collecting data. I went on the Internet and mostly USGS data on what's really happening to our aquifers at the moment, and particularly the effect on agriculture. The, the problem with agriculture is different from um, trying to get water to people or even industry because people and industry tend to be concentrated in large cities. Farms are distributed all over the place and so even if you could get water cleaned from wastewater or from seawater, uh, to get it to the farms is prohibitive. So, so that's the problem. Um, and the second part is I'm going to try to make a case for using the simplest possible models to address the problem. So. Uh, as I said, I'm getting things from the USGS. I want you to focus mostly on the picture here on the right. Um, the issue is that agriculture is, is a very large user of water and uh, compared to other uses, and particularly in the Western states because they tend to be dry and really to make productive crops you have to irrigate. The uh, agriculture in the rest of the US, what is interesting in this picture, is actually increasing and even more so at the moment. So we are doing more infiltration and irrigation than we did in the past. And where I live in Wisconsin, I see really literally every year more irrigation systems appearing for all kinds of things, not just corn, but for grass even. And so that is, that is an issue. So uh, I'm going to present some maps. This is a famous aquifer. You've all heard probably of the Ogallala aquifer or the High Plains aquifer, it's the same thing which extends quite a bit in the United States. You see the picture here on the left where you can see where the aquifer really is uh, as compared to the rest of the United States. And this picture is just, uh, you know, just elevations of ground surface. It has nothing to do with really with groundwater. Though there is a, uh, a really extensive, often quoted report by Leonard Conicow. He works with the USGS. And uh, he is looking, he, he's looked into groundwater depletion over the period 1900 to 2008. Now this is not just collecting data, this is also using models in addition with the data that are collected to try to make better estimates, but in any case that is at the moment is the best estimate we have. But remember this is only to 2008. So now I don't know whether you know what the square cubic kilometer is, but it's really big. And if you use, if the depletion in the USA from 1900 to 2008 is 1,000 square cubic kilometers, that boggles the mind. This is 
even more worrisome between 1900 and 2008. So if you work out the average, and I'm assuming that Leonard did this right, it's 9.2 cubic kilometers per year. But from 2000 to 2008, it's 25 cubic kilometers a year. So you see that is a rather scary increase. So this is a map that Leonard Conical prepared of depletion in the United States. And you see that you can't read, of course. I took this from the Internet. But I, I wrote here in red the number, the, the feet, the number of, cu uh, of cubic kilometers of depletion, and the red is 150 to 400. And if you remember, the total was 1,000 over that period. That's uh, significant. So you can recognize areas here. I mean, this is the San Joaquin Valley. This is um, Arizona. And then you see here some other obvious places here. This is a central area where there's a lot of agriculture. I don't want to go into too much detail, but you see there is a – and what I find, by the way, interesting is that there is a plus. The blue is positive. So uh, water level changes in feet. So this – the previous slide was cubic kilometers, is volume. Now how much is that really in feet? And again, it's the Ogallala Aquifer we're looking at here. And the red is more than 150 feet down. Right, and uh, this color here is 100 to 150, and then 50 to 100, and all the way up to the yellow is going down. Uh, this is a well that was measured to 2003. You see that the, stand, the, the trend is clearly down. And uh, I've, I don't like this kind of slide, but I try to make it as big as possible. But I think the numbers are so significant that I need to show them. So these are are. This is lowering of level over two-year periods, except for the very first ones. So between 2011 and 2013 in Colorado, it went down 14.3 feet, right? But in the year before, 12.9, and then 13.2. So it's every two years we are seeing these dramatic changes, and they are increasing. So in Kansas, it was 23.6, and now it is 25.5, and 14.9, and 16.5. And it, the story goes in, if you look at Texas, 39 feet, and in the next two years it's 41 feet. So I, I must say I knew this. The, the groundwater community is very concerned. And the last uh, multiple more conference two years ago, we were all urged by politicians, actually, to, to tell the story, which is one of the reasons I do this other than Ted's example. So, uh, and I, so I knew this. I've been hearing these kinds of things all the time. I didn't know it was this bad. I never took the trouble to look at the data. It really it just scared me. This is a, 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 gives you some idea what's going on. This is a change in another report, and you see that it's also USDS. The change in irrigated agriculture. So this is in area, you know, how much area is added or not changed or uh, lost. That means it's no longer used. So between 2002 and 2007, so the minus that I've made in red is – is not any more used, and the blue is plus, and the green is no change. As I said, I see in Wisconsin a dramatic increase, but that's, of course, pretty local. Here are the seven states with the highest, highest irrigation area. So this is just in hectares. Uh, you see 3 million, 3 million in Nebraska, California. So California, you know what that is, but Nebraska, you probably know too. That is beef, Texas beef. Arkansas, Idaho. Idaho, surprisingly, a lot of that is, of course, potatoes, but a lot of it is grass. I don't know whether you know this, but the square bales, I'm really jealous of these machines make these beautiful square bales. They're made in Idaho, and they're shipped to China, and then they're put into horse nuts, and they're exported to England. <laughs> I just say, you wonder, you know, <laughs> business is business, but okay. Now, this is I, this I recommend strongly um, to do this. It's called When the Snows Fails. It's by the National Geographic. It's beautiful, beautifully done on the Internet. And I uh, recalled, recalled them and asked whether I could show some of this, and it's impossible to find out. So I just to give the reference, and I said, well. So it's called When the Snows Fail. So the point is that in the California, the San Joaquin Valley, the irrigation is done or used to be done almost exclusively by snowmelt. So you have snowmelt in the mountains. It goes into the reservoirs that are made. The reservoirs fill up, 
and then the reservoirs are used via an intricate system of canals and drains and so on to the Kitsenakin Valley, where it's then used for agriculture. What you see here is change in snowpack between 1955 and 2014. So the blue is increase, there are a few spots, and then the other colors are decrease. And you see it is decreasing dramatically with the result that when you use this, and this is what is used from those reservoirs, so now you have to remember this in blue that is the amount that's available in the reservoir when it's full. And they're not full anymore. But that's, if it is full, that's what is in there. The red, those numbers are use in millions of gallons. And you can see the San Jacques Valley. You can see uh, this is Los Angeles. And then this is Sun City, Phoenix. You can tell where the water is being used. That is Shasta Lake. That is in California, which is north of um, San Francisco. And uh, it's used, of course, for irrigation. And this is 65% below average levels. And the story goes on. This is Lake Mead. It's close to Las Vegas. It's the water source for Las Vegas. 38% full in August 2014. This is all, again, from the National Geographic. It's also in their October 2014 issue, by the way. So uh, what happens is we have a reduction in the surface water surfaces uh, supply for irrigation in California. So what do you do? You increase groundwater pumping. I mean, it's the only option you have. You're farming, and unfortunately also farming things like pistachio nut nuts, which use a lot of water. And they are changing. They, they are changing that. Uh, and the result is this is a measurement in some areas of the San Joaquin Valley. Now, it's down 30 feet. Now, that's not groundwater. That's the surface, right? So the surface of the soil is subsided 30 feet. So now I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, an example. This is a project I was involved with, Bill Nelson, who is quite well known in groundwater. And he was doing work in Idaho trying to improve uh, farming by using water, of course. And the problem is that the water rights in the western states, starting with Colorado going west, are based on when you, your farm was established. Right? So if it's 1820 and somebody else is 1830, then you have the right. The thing is that you can pump as much as you like. There is no limit. So whatever you want to use, you use. And the problem is that's what happens. In Idaho, people do that. Now, this is Idaho. This is a picture. This is a brother of Bill Nelson is farming. They, it was a family farm, years old, and they do this. And you see here the irrigation. The effect of irrigation is dramatic. And it is true, the grass in Idaho is fantastic. You see all these bales here. The production is amazing. You can easily do four crops a year if you irrigate, um, as opposed to, you see, by the way, the irrigation system you see here is actually quite nice. It is, it's wheels with a pipe, very simple, and they just roll over the field. And so you irrigate fairly low. It's not spraying all over. So it's not so bad. So then uh, you can say, well, OK, maybe dryland farming, which is what these farms used to do years ago. Well, the maximum you can get is one eighth of what you normally produce. But you normally really have to do it. You can only harvest once every three or two years. Every three is more normal. And what you do is the years that you don't harvest, you get weeds, and you plow the weeds down into the ground. And that supplies, after a period, enough moisture to get your next crop of grass. There was a, uh, when I was there, there were, one of the issues was that there were springs that were drying up. So they were just drying up. And uh, I talked to a farmer who farmed cattle, beef cattle, and sheep. He lost 1,000 steers because the wells, the springs dried up. He lost a million dollars. And so, <laughs> interesting story, that he, he had his sheep. And normally what they do in the, sum, in the winter, when there's snow in Idaho, you bring your cattle or your sheep to the south, Texas. So he couldn't do that because he didn't have money to pay for the trucks. So he drove them with horses. And we still have laws in this country that allows a farmer to <laughs> run his cattle or his sheep through the land. So he did. And so <laughs> quite original. So now the question is, 
how can we reduce water use? I mean, that's obviously the thing. I mean, we, we still have to do agriculture. We can stop stop eating. I mean, that's so. I think really, as I indicated, the problem with the water scarcity is not so much that you won't have water; it's that you won't have food, or at least beginning with not as luxurious food. So, what can you do to save water? Well, you can irrigate only when needed, and that applies to your lawn also, by the way. And don't do 24-7 as they do in Idaho. Irrigate at night, particularly in a hot climate. There's another story when I, there was a presentation on the same conference by an official from um, Oregon who had a story to tell that the farmers were not allowed to use surface water because of fishing. And so they had to use groundwater. But the farmers in California, next door, had placed big wells along the border with Oregon because they wanted to uh, save money in Texas because they got the tax credit if they used groundwater. So according to this official, his talk was that the farms were about to go under. Fortunately, the people in California actually stopped pumping PTX to Texas and used surface water. And so I talked to him after, the, after his presentation, which was very interesting, and I said, look, how about, would it help if you irrigate at night? Because, you know, it would help. And he said, that's a great idea. So I said, well, could you give the farms in, farmers incentive? Because I farm, I know it doesn't take that much. Farmers get, so, one, two dollars an hour, you know, so a <laughs> dollar goes a long way. So, um, and he said, well, it would be difficult to do. The other thing we can do is not to infiltrate so much that you can afford to put drains in to control the level. I mean, that's really very wasteful. So another thing you can do is modify the method of irrigation. You can, do the, you can use different systems. So you can use high sprinklers that go way up in the air, which can be big losses in evaporation just before it even hits the ground. By low ones, you can do subsurface irrigation, which is used a lot in other nations, not so much in this country. And I, myself, am going to try this, subsurface irrigation using gravity by catching surface runoff. So I'll show you what I have in mind. This is my farm. And um, I think it's two years ago or three years ago, there, there was a drought. There was not very much water. And you can't see this, but I know that in these areas where you can, you can see there's a dip here. And the land is a little wavy. So wherever it was lower, and it's about a foot difference, the grass was much, much taller. So I thought, well, you know, if I could irrigate below surface, I could increase crops. So this is what I was proposing. So, uh, and we have these things. If I go back a second, you can see there's a pond here that catches surface runoff. So I could make one or use one. And then capture the runoff. We get a lot of runoff. Very, very intense rainstorms over there these days. So catch it. Then put drains in below surface with side cross drains. And this is that drain spacing formulas. This is old technology. In the Netherlands, they've been doing it for a long time. And so do that. And uh, the advantage is that it's cheap. You, I can use my own equipment. I don't need anybody to help me. You don't need any power because you use gravity. And you use the excessive runoff, which now goes out. And there's low maintenance. Now, when you're a farmer and you make one of these basins, ponds, the DNR pays for it. So, well, I thought I called the DNR. So I called the DNR. And in Wisconsin, they're very supportive. They were there next day. So I said, OK, this is the plan I want to put in. This is where I want to show them where I want to put in the pond. And they said, OK, where do you put the overflow? I said, well, way up, because I want to catch it. And no, 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 we can't support that. There's no money for that. This is for erosion control. So if you catch the water, you prevent the erosion, and then it goes out to the stream. And I said, well, I'd like to use it for irrigation. And they said, it's a great idea. We're very sympathetic, but we can't give you any money for it. So it illustrates that you, we are going to have to change a few things. So there's commercial subsurface irrigation. This is a plot I, from UC Davis. This is done uh, in the San Joaquin Valley. 
And I got uh, two images that were surprising to me, by the way, from the California Agriculture. That's an online journal. So this is the result. And this is how you put it in. And this is quite surprising. You see these rolls. That is a very thin tube that's perforated. And the tractor is moving this down. I don't know if you've ever seen how you put in telephone lines these days and, and things like that. So you have a machine, and it drives over, and it pulls the thing into the ground. And they do the same thing here with irrigation. So that's a nice, really nice system to have that machine. OK, so uh, now we're getting to the second part, is how can we manage these resources? And so this is, uh, this is very nice software I use that makes it look as though it's hand-drawn. Of course, it's computer-generated. <laughs> it's very good. <laughs> so, so this is a section of an aquifer, a groundwater table, and these leaky layers, and it's very complicated. Now, one thing about groundwater that's really counterintuitive is that the scales are not at all like you see here. I mean, we make the drawings like that. I put it like that in my book. And, Every geologist even puts it much more. But the horizontal to the vertical scale, we are talking something like 1,000 to 1. So this line that I drew here is a section, oops, I didn't want to do it, a section of this to scale, and even that is exaggerated. So you have to think about that the, what the losses in energy are sideways. So groundwater is very different from open channel flow. In open channel flow, and it's always difficult for students taking groundwater after learning hydraulics. In hydraulics, there's very little head loss. In Bernoulli, you know, you use energy is, is barely lost. In groundwater, it's all about energy loss. So in fluids, the term V squared over 2G in the energy equation, that's the governing one. In groundwater, it's negligible. Groundwater flows. In my farm, to get from the highest point to the boundary, about 100 years, 150. So V squared over 2G, <laughs> forget it. So um, what do we need to make models of these things? If we want to see whether things are cons what we do is sustainable, we need models. So what do we need? We need hydraulic conductivity. That is a property of both the soil and the water that uh, controls how easy it's to flow through the aquifer. Aquifer configuration, what I just showed with all these different layers. Storativity that has to do with how things change over time. Infiltration, I put an X where we have reasonable data. Boundary conditions, we have reasonable data. And boundary locations, these models have artificial boundaries. And nobody ever knows what, what the importance of it is because everybody in consulting uses the maximum grid in the maximum size and never looks what happens if you would make it bigger or smaller. It's just no time. And parameter estimation is not unique. Now, this is a typical, this is a video to illustrate things. This is Bunny Ask, found this on the internet for me. This is uh, a model, and you see horizontal, you know, there are lots and lots of elements. Very often, each of them has a different hydraulic conductivity. Thousands and thousands of parameters, complex constructions, structures, and lots and lots of data. So it's not cheap. And the problem is that all these data, these hydraulic conductivity, all this stuff that goes in is not unique, and it's very difficult to get. And Randall and I did a simple analysis. This is a very simple case. We have an exact solution for flow in the plane of the drawing with circular inhomogeneities that fully penetrate this layer. And they are the hydraulic conductivities of the background is one, and all these things have different ones. And so we said, well, if we have data collected at the green dots with a small measurement error, how good is the result? If we give the flow rates, which in reality we don't, usually don't have. So that's a picture of contour lines of head, elevations of common level, if you like. And uh, so this is the actual, and that is simulated. So it's great. I mean, this is, looks really, Randall did a great job. I mean, this is fantastic. Now here are the values. The true values and the fitted values. This is one of those cases of no comment, right? So order of magnitude off. Now, you can actually improve this. I'm not entirely fair because we are suggesting a way to improve this. But it does illustrate the problem. And there was a talk uh, on also in the same conference. These conferences are very good because it's probably the most best attended Conference every two years. 
people all over the world. And there's a very well-known person at the USG, as Mary Hill, who is specialized in parameter estimation. And one of the sessions was focusing on how reliable are groundwater models. That isn't a good topic. And the consensus was not nearly as good as our weather prediction models. And that was not a joke. And the reason is that if we do weather prediction, we have an automatic validation, right? You say, okay, over the day after tomorrow, it's going to rain. Well, if it doesn't rain, we all know it. So they fix the models, or they try to fix the models. In groundwater, we don't have that luxury. These models are very expensive to make, and we rarely put in the measurements and the effort to verify that they're really correct. So it's something to remember. So here is the problem. They require large amounts of data that we don't have. They're very expensive to create. The predictions are rarely tested. Hundreds of thousands of data. Difficult to determine what data are really important. And the reliability of the predictions is questionable. Now, this is true. This is not just fantasy. This is reality. So my suggestion is make things simple. Go back to the simplest possible things we can do. Try to, but that's, of course, that's much harder. The people do very complex models because it's easier, right? I mean, if I make a very complicated model, everything is in it. I use GIS to get everything in my model, and everything is included, you know, and I get all this parameter estimation. I validate it by looking at observation. That's a, no, I'm, I'm covered. If somebody says, oh, this is a lousy model, how, how do you mean? Huh? I can defend it. If you want to make a simple model, you better have the essence of the problem right there. And that takes a lot more. So that's one of the reasons that you need somebody like Einstein to be able to really do that. So I, this is my favorite quote. Make a model. Model should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. Right. So I'm going to give you two examples of how we can do things. The first one is sustainable groundwater use for farms. And the second one is how can we reduce saltwater intrusion. I might not get to the second one. It depends on how much time I have. So, the first thing to do if we want to look at sustainability on the farm scale is focus on discharge rates. Now, this is a, a big thing. If I want to predict in groundwater how long it takes for water to travel from point A to point B in three dimensions, that's a nearly impossible task. That's the kind of task we are facing if there's contaminant transport. And that task we can usually only do well on a very small scale. That we don't have to worry about. I couldn't care less where it's going. I only care how much I'm getting from outside my area and how much I have supplied from rainfall. So we, we first of all start with vertically integrated flow models. This, this model you saw with all these layers vertically, we don't worry about. We, this is not the issue. And for a single aquifer now, everybody knows I love equations, so I couldn't resist at least putting one in, one set. So this is a single aquifer, but it's important, though, because this is uh, math. This is the total integrated flow rate over the thickness of the aquifer. And this potential, this is a potential that governs the flow. And we know what equations it satis must satisfy. We know it in terms of, it exactly in terms of the hydraulic connectivity, average piezometric head, the saturated thickness of the aquifer. Now, we don't know these things. There, first of all, there, if I have this function phi, there are two unknowns, so I can't solve it. But it so happens that on the boundaries, at rivers, and many, many places, we have a very good idea of what the value is, and so we can then solve the problem. Of course, I can't get the head levels everywhere, but I can get the discharge. And that is what we want. We just want the discharge. And I'm going to show you... Uh, plan of my farm because I want to apply it to that. In fact, I, I can do that, and it's a good example. So this is the farm, and if you look that way to get a feel for what the land looks like, so we're looking that way. The next picture shows you, so I'm looking that way, right? So I'm going to take this boundary, that's the boundary of the land I own, and I want to know, given the data on infiltration and, and soil types come in because infiltration is governed to, in part of, on what, is, what the soil can carry. I can actually do a very simple analysis. I can put my boundary in, I put areas of infiltration, I add wells and a pond, and I run the model. And how do I run the model? 
I'll explain it in a minute. So this is uh, what it looks like. This is in, in uh, California, what farms look like. And I just show you that you can do that. This is a farm, and this is the boundary of the farm. And you could make a rough estimate how much is coming over the boundary or not and what the net is. So here is the idea. So you have a complex system. In the Twin Cities, we have that kind of system. It bores, actually, because these things are not horizontal. So there's a stream, there's infiltration, there's leakage between these things, there's flow. Now, there's a paper that I published with the town. I published recently, it's in, appeared in Water Resources Research, where uh, we, are, we are modeling this by integrating vertically. So there's also a solution for all the layers individually, but we also have the integrated solution. So we can compare, using that result, we can compare what we get if we ignore the details. And to give you an idea how this works, let's look at a very simple case. So this is a circle. I make my farm into a circle. It's not 2,500 meters, but somebody else's farm. There's uniform infiltration. We forget about variation hydraulic conductivity. Radius R. I know the flow rate at the boundary because what's infiltrating is the infiltration rate times the area, pi r squared times n, divided by the circumference of the boundaries, 2 pi r, get 1 half nr. I know that. That's the flow rate out. I don't need hydraulic connectivity. I don't need anything else. It doesn't give me velocity, but I couldn't care less about velocity. And, of course, if there's a variation in hydraulic connectivity, there would be the discharge would not be uniform, but still the integral would be 1 half nr. And so it's independent of hydraulic connectivity. So I'm already eliminating one of the parameters that are so hard to get. So let's make this a little more general. So here's a farm, and the yellow is the boundary of the farm that I want, I'm interested in. And this is the actual system. And the wells, I couldn't care less in what layer they are. I just need to know how much they pump. Right? That is essential. I need to know how much. I need to know rates. I need to know the infiltrations on these areas. And so based on mass balance, vertically integrated flow rate, not worried about vertical placements, I can get an answer to it. And actually, there's a very, I did resist in trying, not giving you the data on that, but you can very elegantly, very simply, in this model, give you pinpointed total integrated flow rate. So you can, at a glance, you would know immediately, get an estimate how, what is the net flow total on the boundary, and you can also get by section how much comes out. And I think that would be quite useful. So. How does this work in real life? Well, we have existing features, a river and a lake and other stuff. But we're adding this thing as a unit. Now, we're trying to do this so that we're not doing a lot more infiltration than we take out and don't take out a lot more than, than uh, we get in. So the effect on the other features is not really that much. So, and the existing features, they will affect the flow through these boundaries. But it will go straight through because it's not infiltrating. So what comes in on one end goes out on the other. So net, all these complicated things have nothing to do with the total that comes in or out. So I can add things. I can just add the effect of all that white stuff and get an idea how much is leaving the boundary. So as I said, we have to go really simple. So as a final example, I think I'm doing OK. I want to talk about saltwater intrusion. That's in Minnesota. It's, we can live without that problem, I think. But <laughs> there are many places, for example, the Netherlands and Israel and Australia. I just was in Australia last year, and that is really critical. So there, there have been lots of ways to, that people have tried to reduce uh, intrusion of the saltwater. So essentially what you have is something like this. So you have an interface between salt water and fresh water. So this is the sea. That's salt groundwater. This is fresh groundwater. And the, the key is, in Australia, for example, they have this basin. Same thing in the Netherlands. So the question is, where is this tip? Right? I mean, that is the intrusion. That is, if it goes out, out away from the sea, then that's bad. And if it goes back. So people have tried, including myself, actually, to come up with ways to recharge groundwater. So you put recharge well. Uh, closer to the coast to try to get the water to go out. It's expensive and it's not all that successful. So there's a paper by Bonnie and myself in, that's submitted to Water is under review where we deal with uh, both unconfined and confined conditions. This is a layered system. So you, what you have to see here is all, all these layers have different properties. 
And also here, what we do is use this idea of vertically integrated flow. I call that comprehensive discharge. It's actually, uh, I've used it quite a while. And so this, this blue line is the interface, and the question is now, the question that I was asking in the paper is, what is happening to this tip if, you know, depending on the distribution of these hydraulic connectivities? And I got an interesting result that I want to investigate further, perhaps use a proposal. So this is a, a section through the coast, and this is a simple example. So this is two layers, right? So we have seawater here. The white is, is salt seawater. It's groundwater, but it's salt. The coast is here. This is a simplified model, so it's, don't, it's not exact. These are flow rates in the two layers. I call the thickness of each layer H1 of the first one and H2 of the second. These are transmissivities. That's how easy it is to get to flow through the aquifer. It's actually the hydraulic connectivity multiplied by the thickness. So I'm defining H as the sum of these two. So I get the equations. T is the sum of the transmissivities. And what we want to know is what is the value of this XT, right? I mean, that is the key. What, what is that going to be? Well, this is the formula, really surprising simple. So what is this? This is the location of the tip, right, away from the coast. This is the location that the tip would be at if the transmissivity would be uniform but equal to the, this T, right? So I, I have one case, same transmissivity, but it's uniform. The second case, where the lower one is very transmissive and the upper one is not. Now, you can argue whether or not that is a good comparison, but that is what I've done. So what you see here is this really simple equation. I have to admit to my shame <laughs> that I went from very complicated equations to slightly less complicated to slightly less complicated, and eventually got this thing. So when T1, now this is a, I want you to try to follow me here. When T1 is almost T, that means that the upper layer has very little transmissivity, right? If this one is taking almost all of the transmissivity for itself, then there's not much left for this one. So then this is almost one. And if we do that in a very thin layer, so transmissivity is the hydraulic connectivity times the layer, so that's to be very high hydraulic connectivity. So then H1 over H is small. So this is approaching one minus one is zero. So that really surprised me because it suggests, now this is not the whole answer, I mean this needs a lot of further investigation, but it suggests that if we use this marvelous technology that we've developed for getting oil to increase the hydraulic connectivity of the, these aquifers locally, not everywhere, but locally very much, then if we go upstream from there with our wells, we might be a lot safer. Than we now. So that is something I want to do. But it's an example. I gave, it, I gave these examples mostly because I think we have to attack these problems with a very simple way of thinking and quickly. We can't say, well, you see, if we start making big models, now first of all, we have to get the government to, to decide that there has to be support for creating these big models, which is going to take forever. Then we have to get people to do it, and then once we have it, we really have to use it. We just don't have that luxury. We really have to start looking on all kinds of scales whether what we're doing is sustainable and what happens if we make changes to our practices. For example, I'm convinced that if you start doing the subsurface irrigation that they do in the San Joaquin Valley, for many things, for grass for sure, you can really be a lot more efficient than just spraying this water all over the place. If you, um, as I said, if you look at, at the big, big dairy farms near where I live in Wisconsin, you know, those, that's a big irrigation system. They are going on all the time. And the corn is, you know, the, they use the uh, uh, Roundup to kill everything in the soil, so it's dead, and then the, everything has to be water and fertilizer. And so I talked to, he delivered hay to one of them. <laughs> He told me, you know, it's, it's, really, it's really strange, but your water tastes so much better than ours. I don't really see how to, I said, well, you know, he has this big pond where all his cow stuff is dumped. So I thought maybe there's a reason. Okay, so that's what I had, and uh, I would welcome any questions.
So we have plenty of time for discussion. Uh, I forgot to mention that Professor Strock does have uh, a highly cited textbook, Groundwater Mechanics. It took 15 or 20 years to write. <laughs> I, I'm quick with these things. Man. And his second book is coming out, How to Apply the First Book. <laughs> I'm only halfway through. I only use 10 years, so I need another. I rounded. So. <laughs> You're right. Okay, so questions? Yes. Wait, you have to hand the microphone. So both of the examples you gave were for fairly local scale things. What would you, how would you apply this very simple model to regional? Well, you can still do, you can still use the same principles. As I said, the, you have to be careful. So uh, the, the bigger you make it, you know, the more you have to think about it. But adding things like the effect of rivers and, and streams and lakes is not really a big deal. So I'm not really saying you need to, you need to really limit it to this scale. But it's very important to keep it as simple as possible. So um, analytically, when you do these things, you, you don't have that much freedom to make it too complicated. And you have to remember that you're focusing on discharges. Right? So, so if you do it that way and you look at the larger scale model, then you have to say where are the places where water is coming in and where is it coming out. You know, is the river flow going to be affected very much with, with what I'm doing with the irrigation? Do I need to include it? As I said, the superposition is it's a valid thing up to a point. It only is not valid if you start chain, making major changes in, what, in your practices close to a river because then the, the flows from the river will change. So it takes some judgment. I mean, if you do this, it's, it would be heaven for people who are very good at creating models because it takes judgment. See, the, the difference is that if you make – the complex models are very expensive because it takes a lot of time. The simple models are not as expensive but require a lot of knowledge. But we have that. We have, there, there are plenty of modelers that are easily capable of doing these things. Yeah, that is sure. Oh, great. So um, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head that the simpler models don't uh, require kind of judgment. Yes. How would you get the average person to accept that you actually do know what you're doing without inundating them with, here's all the information that we took and we crammed it into this huge complex model and just make, boring them with all these details? How would you get them to accept something so simple? Well, because uh, you can make nice analogies. So, for example, budget, right? So you, <laughs> you have a budget. In this case, um, if, you, if you want a total budget, you really need to know how, what comes in and what goes out. And that is a co concept that's not so hard. And I've done that. I mean, it's not so hard to communicate. So I, act, I, I do think that even though the modelers like to make a complex model because it makes, it's easily defensible, for the people on the other end, the simpler the model, the easier for them to understand. So if you say, look, this is what you, it's clear. If this is what you infiltrate, and that is what you take out, what you take out is less than what you infiltrate over your area, clearly you're okay. So the, the difficulty comes in when you go beyond that and you say, okay, I do more out, I take more out and comes in, where is it coming from? Now it's more detailed. You still can do that quite well, I think, by doing vertically integrated flows. If they say, I really want to know whether it's in layer three or layer one, then I say, well, yeah, now you need to use a complex model, but I don't think you need to. So I really think that a, the simpler things are, provided you can explain it well, the more attractive and the easier explained. Because the big model is just a big black box. I mean, it's nothing more. You can say everything is in it. This is the nice picture, but it's still a black box, and people just So, uh, Otto, in your one-layer model, yeah. I keep thinking you have to be fitting something to make it work. Are you fitting something, and is it the hydraulic conductivity, an effective hydraulic conductivity? No, I'm not, because, again, it's, it's total flow rate. If I know this is what goes in, then if the hydraulic conductivity is low, for example, it just means you get higher water levels. 
So to find out whether or not you're actually depleting, all you need to know is what comes into the area and what you're taking out. So what comes in would be rainfall? Yeah, infiltration. And, but then you have flow across the boundaries. Doesn't matter because if it's not infiltrating, what come, it's a good question. What comes in on the one side goes out on the other. But if the divergence is zero, then integrated over an area, it's zero. So that's so, your assumption. Yeah, that's, no, it's not an assumption because if I, have a, if, it, if I have a feature like a river over here, that's not adding anything to my aquifer. But you could be accumulating water, you could be losing water. Transient. Right. Yes. But so if you go to transient flow, that's a level up. But if we say, well, over the summer, I have so much infiltration total, and I'm pumping so much out, and I couldn't care less how much goes into storage. That's just an extra thing. Okay. So if you had transient flow, transient flow, then what would you do? If you have transient flow, you have to go, that's, that's one level up. You can still do it. So we can still do the same thing, provided that we let the rainfall be transient, right? and the wells be transient, and you still could superimpose it onto the rest, provided that, that the river levels are not going crazy up and down and so on. But it is, it is I mean, if, the, if your point is, and that's the correct point, if your point is it's approximate, then yes. It's definitely approximation. But the issue is, and I think that's a primary issue, we have to act. And this is on the safe side. If I ignore storage change, I'm on the safe side. If I make sure that over half a year there's not more taken out and goes in, I'm safe. So a question for, big, big, easy question to ask Cardin and answer. Do you believe that as a country we can achieve some level of sustainability without changes in our water law? No. Well, I don't think so. <laughs> because, no, the, the water law is, it, it invites really terrible things. So there was a story, fortunately it, didn't, it did not happen, there was a story in um, the ripple effect. I forgot the author, but the ripple effect. You can Google it. <laughs> These days if you don't know, you can, oh, just Google it. But, <laughs> but um, the issue was that in Colorado there are farms that are huge, thousands and thousands of acres, and these huge farms are old. So there was a guy in Texas who made money in oil who bought the farm. And his plan was to sell the water to Houston because he could just pump as much as he liked from that farm. Now, it didn't happen. And it's, it's not quite clear whether it happened because people in Colorado got upset and angry and there was a lot of hula baloo and so on. But clearly, that water law invited that. And it will keep inviting these things because as we get more into this hole, the water is going to be more and more expensive and valuable. So people with the means to buy these farms will start doing it. And they're all over. Idaho, you know, you just, it's, it's, it's not a secret. You can find out which is the farm with the oldest water rights. And you buy up these farms and you start mining the water and you sell it. So the water laws are certainly a problem. And what I've been told by lawyers in Colorado repeatedly is it's impossible to change, that's what I'm quoting, because the people who are counting are people who don't want to change the law. Because many of them are taking advantage of it or have farms. Or so if you have people who have these rights, it's very difficult to convince them to give them up. So that's, and that is, you, but you're absolutely right, Randall. I mean, that is one of the big problems. On the other hand, we can do a lot of the things rather cheaply. As I said, subsurface irrigation is something you can do and is, is paying off. I don't know whether it would be paying off here, but it's certainly in the San Joaquin Valley. It just pays. You know, it is, it's a commercial, commercially positive thing. The nice thing about it is they're fairly low maintenance, far more power, use, far less power use than the other irrigation systems. So. Yes. I don't remember the name of the book, but evidently I got this book from the American Water Works Association a few years ago. Yes. And it has quite a bit of information on Southern California. Yes. Evidently some of the land when it was sold didn't have the water rights go with the land. Oh. oh. And it's very interesting about sustainability 
how the farmers that ha bought this land without the water rights have changed their practices. They sometimes they had to change crops, the ones that they could use less, but they started a lot of this subsurface trickle drip irrigation and stuff, still getting real impressive uh, yields, at least to me, a non-farmer. Yeah. It, no, it was no, very I'm, interesting. Yeah, no, I'm convinced, being a farmer, that, you know, you, you're, farming is an expensive business. <laughs> so, you know, but it, it is definitely true that anything that makes commercial sense, and especially saves time, it's very important, is, is popular. So if you have an irrigation system that saves time, and it's certainly less maintenance, and certainly if you do it by gravity, I mean, it's, it's significantly less, that is attractive. So I think if I, farmers are very practical, so if I do it and show that it works, and I show them the results, they will be open to it. Okay, one last question. You, this is sort of a follow-up to Randall's, and you, you kind of answered it, but I'll push you a little further. Um, if we have to change water law, how do scientists and engineers push it so that logic actually is taken into account and, and reality is, is part of, of the water law and, and where we need to go in terms of sustainability. I mean, do you have any ideas of how that can happen? Well, that's a difficult question. It, uh, obviously, the first thing to do is to get this, this time dependence out of it, you know. And um, if you start doing things like here, if you want to irrigate, you need a permit. And that is already a very good thing. So these misuses in, in Minnesota and Wisconsin are a lot less because you can just, just put a well in and, and pump. Now, one of the things, the first things to do is to give the DNR more power in this because they really don't have enough. I mean, they, they can't really deny enough. So they're very careful. Uh, they have to have a very strong case to say, well, your maximum flow rate is this. There are other problems. I talk to people from DNR that they tell me, that really surprised me, if they want to collect data on a farm, right? Well, they can't just go on a farm. They have to ask the farmer. And so I said, well, okay, they let you go on. No, no, they don't. No, no, they're very protective of their land. So I can't imagine. I would just say, please. But, uh, so that's, that, those are things we have to do. I mean, convince people that it's a good thing to let the DNR collect data because it is you know, a better thing to do is know how it should be distributed and how to permit. So the permitting, so step one is go from the water law to permitting, and the next step is make, try to make the permitting based on real life, you know. And also, don't grow very expensive crops in terms of water in a very dry area. You know, you see some of these, these crops. <laughs> it's just in the San Joaquin Valley where you think, well, you know, why? So I think we will, at some point, we will have fewer that's your nuts, for example. Well, you can live with that. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay, we do have a wine and cheese reception uh, following, so please join us, and Otto will be available for questions then. And sure. Help me. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Joe.